Hellbenders are North America's largest species of salamander and can grow to the shocking length of over two feet long. With a name of uncertain origin, it is thought that they are named by settlers who thought their appearance resembled a creature bent on returning to the underworld. Researchers, however, are more concerned with keeping them in this world, and the threat of a pathogenic fungus stands to devastate salamander populations if it gets to North America, known as Betrachochytrium salamandivorans, or b -cell for short. There is another salamander species which is highly susceptible to bee cell and also very widespread, known as the eastern newt. And their susceptibility, coupled with their mobility, may mean that eastern newts could act as super spreaders. My name is Mike DiGirolamo, your host for Manga Bay Explores, a special podcast series about some of the most recent reporting from MangaBay.com's global team. Join me for a deeper discussion of one such project, where I've explored issues with experts on the front lines of the looming salamander pandemic. To find out what we know now, and what is being done to keep North America's and the world's salamanders safe. On this episode, I spoke with Dr. Becky Hardman from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and Dr. Anna Longo of the University of Florida, experts in two fascinating and unique salamanders, the ever iconic and large hellbender, and the very small, but very abundant Eastern Newt, their fates of which could be consequential in the face of a B-cell outbreak in the contiguous United States. Speaking with both Dr. Hardman and Dr. Longo shed more light on the complexity of wildlife disease, and even greater detail on the vulnerability of the North American continent to B-cell. While there is much to learn, the Eastern Newt and the Hellbender can offer us a picture into key knowledge that we need to know in order to prepare ourselves for what experts say is inevitable. I'm uh, Rebecca Hardman. I uh, was a PhD student, a uh, veterinarian at UT. Um, I recently graduated, so I'm a researcher working with UT right now and some other institutions in Tennessee here doing kind of wildlife disease research. And how long have you been studying hellbenders or when did you first start looking into them? Yeah, yeah, 2011. So it's it's been <laughs> it's been uh, almost a decade now, which is pretty amazing. It was a project my uh, advisor, my PhD advisor at the time, I was working for her kind of as a, a lab technician and she had a project in Arkansas looking at disease and hellbenders. Um, and I can go into a little more detail and a little bit about what's going on there. They wanted someone to come out and kind of do some preliminary pathogen surveillance in Arkansas in these guys. Um, and she knew that prior to working for her, I, I was a herpetologist. And so she knew I had experience in the field. And so that's where we got started, just kind of starting to test some of these guys for some known amphibian pathogens at the time. And was there anything notable that you found from that study that relates to what we're talking about now? The disease in hellbenders gets complicated because we have two different subspecies. The eastern subspecies is um, has a much larger range coming from New York all the way down historically into Mississippi. The Ozark subspecies is really restricted to the Ozark Highlands of Missouri and Arkansas. And that subspecies, even though both subspecies are not doing well, that one is really declining at a, at a much higher rate than the Eastern, um, as well as there have been reports over the past decade or longer of these strange lesions in the toes, just really bad looking toes, swollen, ulcerated. And so what we found so far is that A, it's, not, it's, it's complicated about what exactly is going on with these lesions. We don't still have the greatest answer of exactly how they manifest. But from the surveillance work that I started over there, we do know that even though BD is probably, BD, sorry, a chytrid fungus related to B-cell, the one that was kind of the first chytrid pandemic, that is in a lot of hellbender populations without disease. But we did find that with animals with worse lesions, when we scored the lesions, the ones with uh, worse lesion scores were more likely to be infected with BD. So there, there is some evidence showing that it may play a role in the actual severity of disease. It might contribute to how fast the disease progresses. They're, they're more than just infection of this one pathogen to cause the disease or something else going on, because we do see it in healthy individuals as well. But there, there is some kind of multifactorial contribution of potentially BD and maybe other pathogens in these lesions. 
In other words, Betrachochytrium dendrobatidis, or BD, obviously can contribute to the prevalence of the skin lesions found on hellbenders, but the situation is a bit more complex since there's a variety of environmental factors that are compromising the health of these salamanders, leaving them more vulnerable to disease. It gets complicated. So in hellbenders in general, BD seems to have about a prevalence of between 20 and 30 percent, meaning that in general, one out of five, between one out of three hellbenders that you swab is going to be positive for BD. And the majority of those hellbenders do not have obvious clinical signs of disease. So a lot of studies have been done, um, either ones I've involved in or not, that have just gone out and swabbed hellbenders, looked to see if they were sick, and found it pretty prevalent among these populations without any signs of disease. Whereas what I was finding in the Ozark hellbenders is there seemed to be an increased risk of infection in the animals that had worse lesions. So it's hard to say if because the lesions are so bad, they're more likely to be infected with BD or that BD infection potentiates these lesions and makes them worse in that case. There may be a factor of environment, genetics, and maybe one or more pathogens that are all contributing towards a, some kind of chronic disease process. And what I would like to do is, even though it's multifactorial, is figure out where we can intervene and stop one of those things that is needed to cause disease. Where Maybe we can't control BD, but maybe we can control a particular environmental stress factor that then controls that disease. Gotcha. And that's a great segue into my next question was I was going to ask you, these populations of hellbenders have declined pretty much everywhere since the 1970s. And I was going to ask you what has caused that, what has contributed to that. And it sounds like it could be many things and you're not precisely sure what it is, but I was wondering if you could kind of delve more into that. You know, of course, my research has been on the health and disease side of things, which I think is contributing. But a lot of research has been done looking at populations associated with habitat alteration, changes in the buffer along the watersheds. And it's tough and to really get a clear answer when you're looking at how landscape can affect a population, especially a slow growing population, um, you know, a long lived animal like hellbenders. But the more and more people look at it, the more and more there is evidence showing that changes in the landscape are somehow affecting how these animals can either reproduce or stay alive long enough to produce enough young or affect the survival of the young. There's something going on, especially in young hellbenders, where we're seeing less and less of them. And it's still up in the air exactly how potentially sedimentation from changes in you know, decreased forest buffer are affecting the ability of hellbenders to produce young and have those young survive. And so we're seeing in a lot of these populations that we do find hellbenders, we're just seeing the old, old individuals that have lived on because they can live, you know, at least 20 years in the wild, much longer in captivity that we know of. The age of hellbenders makes studying them in captivity even more complicated since they can live 20 years. But there's another unique feature about them worth noting that makes them stand out even more from other salamanders. Something really remarkable about hellbenders, I, I guess, that maybe some other people listening might not know off the top of their heads is, is how large these salamanders are. And, and I, would, I just wanted to see if you could comment on their sheer size and, and what accounts for that. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's... It is such an amazing animal, and I agree with you that they, you know, sometimes when you say something's unique, you know, all species have their unique part in the world, but hellbenders to me really are unique. I mean, they're part of this giant salamander family with only three species, and they're only species that exist in the United States. And you're right, they can get, you know, two feet long, over a kilogram in weight in some populations. And so when you lift a rock, potentially in some of these streams, and you see this giant creature there, it's really amazing. Um, and they're, they're heavy. And they're one of the few animals, uh, amphibians, you know, I do a lot of health analysis that I actually draw blood from like a lizard, you know, because they're just so big, I actually can access a vein and, and uh, draw a good amount of blood. I mean, they're, they're big creatures and really remarkable kind of part of the United States that people don't even know about that we should kind of cherish almost. Just for a reference on their size, 
At one point, Dr. Hardman and her team witnessed a hellbender regurgitate an entire hot dog. While it's not the prettiest image, it's nonetheless shocking when you realize that this is an aquatic amphibian. And some salamanders are merely the size of your thumb. I read somewhere that, that there had been lab testing of B-Sal on hellbenders to, to kind of test their susceptibility and how they respond to it. And I wanted to see if you could kind of tell us more about that. And I also read that young hellbenders were not dying when infected with B-Cell. Correct me if I'm wrong, but can you elaborate more on that? Yeah, and I can only elaborate a little bit just because this is still unpublished data. It's definitely available, you know, in, in some abstracts from some talks. But as, as far as we know with hellbenders, yeah, there have been some juveniles tested. Right now, we don't that's all we know is that they've been tested and there may be potential for disease. There was only one uh, small group tested so far. It's tough to test hellbenders in any situation just because the adults take so long, you know, 20 years plus to grow if you're, you know, kind of keeping them in the lab. So we still don't know anything about adults. I would caution to say that it can't affect hellbenders because with BD, is, uh, which is the other chytrid fungus, you know, we're finding that on hellbenders just fine even in captive collections, but then after a stressful event, maybe the power goes out and the water warms up really quickly, then all of a sudden you get an outbreak of chytridiomycosis and deaths from that. So I think in a lot of these animals that aren't overtly susceptible in a normal trial, kind of like uh, some of these newt species where, you know, you give them b sal no matter what, they're going to die. Some of these animals that kind of fall into the, the middle category, they may be fine until you add another stressor and then they can die pretty quickly as well. That's all speculative, but that's what we see with BD. And so we're, tr we still, to, and unfortunately don't know much about exactly how b sal is going to be in these animals based on kind of just one in infection trial. But at least we know that maybe they're they're less susceptible than some of these um, newt species, but really it's it's still pretty preliminary. While it's only been verified in lab testing, the speculation that hellbenders develop chytridiomycosis when stressed, much like in the way that a compromised immune system might leave a human open to getting sick, doesn't bode well for hellbenders. What if then they were infected with B cell? It's a worrying scenario to contemplate. Yeah, the, it's correct, at least in captivity, that we see some kind of stressful event and then potentially chytridiomycosis afterwards. There haven't been any true trials to really test that, and so it's really hard to say. But that's anecdotally what we've been seeing in captivity is hellbenders can die, and it's definitely a pathogen you don't want in your captive collections. But in the wild, we don't know what kind of stressor could trigger that. You know, if it's chronic changes in the water, is that enough of an acute kind of a one, you know, a stress, a really hard stressor to then get chytridiomycosis? But we don't want to rule out the possibility that if these animals are chronically stressed, like any vertebrate, you know, you're chronically stressed, you may have the potential or more likely to get more sick from a disease or, or more likely to get more infections than you normally would. And maybe that slow grind on that population is accumulating more than we think. But again, unfortunately, it's so hard to test that and it's still speculative. Is there any effort being done to, to further test that or get more information on it? I know it's difficult, but is there anyone working to, to find that out? You know, not that I know of. I know there are some there's a lot more captive collections, not necessarily in Tennessee, that I'm not involved with that, that may be doing that. But the main focus of a lot of these collections is to get juveniles out. We're trying, a lot of people have seen that potentially if you get them past a certain critical life stage, you know, for whatever reason, that life stage is uh, more susceptible, kind of like sea turtles, you know, getting kind of getting them past a certain critical life stage and then releasing them back in the wild. So a lot of those collections are uh, don't want to use any of their animals they spent years raising to test this. Again, with BD, I know some other labs in New York have at least looked at whether or not they can get disease and whether or not how the immune system responds. And they, and they definitely can. They have seen chytridiomycosis in these trials. But I don't think there's been any testing on, you know, trying to actually give them an acute stress event and then see, you know, if, if they're more susceptible or not. That still hasn't been tested. Even more complicated for hellbenders, other than their lab testing logistics, 
is that unlike terrestrial salamanders, they live their entire lives in river systems, and they are constantly exposed not to just waterborne fungal pathogens, but basically any changes to the environment that flow downstream. I think a, a lot of it has to do with their life history and their natural history, meaning, you know, how they live out their lives and what they need to reproduce. A lot of these salamanders that are doing well are, are terrestrial. And as long as they have the right habitat, they're smaller, they have smaller home ranges, and they can maintain populations in potentially a smaller forest plot, you know, as long as that forest is providing the microhabitats they need, those populations can kind of maintain in that smaller area. When you talk about hellbenders, they live in river systems, and those rivers accumulate anything coming from the entire watershed. And so I think if there's any changes along any part of that watershed, there's a potential for them to be affected. And there is uh, one group out of Virginia Tech that actually looked at changes in different sizes of landscape scales and found that at a fairly good scale around that forest, the forest buffer we call it, if there's changes, that definitely was related to whether or not hellbenders, the populations were doing well. And so it really seems to be they can be affected from far away, as opposed to maybe these smaller sal salamanders were really, as long as their micro environment and their small home ranges are intact, you can maintain populations in smaller patches of forest. It is interesting to me though, that there are other salamanders that live in these river systems that we haven't noticed declining as much, such as mud puppies. But now I think people are noticing them declining as well. And maybe it was something we just weren't paying attention to as much with the hellbenders as before. You know, they need a very special place under a rock that's clear. The rocks need to have... It's not too big of a space, not too small of a space. It needs to have the silt out where they maintain their eggs. And then once the larvae hatch, they need a very nice kind of rock pebbles and different types of substrate to hide into. Once they're adults, they need the larger rocks to hide under. So the population requires this nice heterogeneous clean water system, which is affected by just any changes in that forest. And I think that's the big problem. Would it be fair to say that maybe perhaps other salamander species don't necessarily need such stringent or specific living conditions? It, yeah, it, it might be that. There, you know, there are a lot of stream salamanders in the family Plethodonidae, Desbicnathus, uh, what we call the dusky salamanders, living in smaller streams. And again, you know, they should be affected by these changes as well. But I think what it comes down to is the hellbenders living in bigger rivers at kind of at the bottom of this whole watershed chain, you know, really being affected by changes along the whole peak, where again, these stream salamanders, if you get a smaller stream within one section of forest that's doing well, they'll be maintained. But of, of course, they're still susceptible to changes in the forest, I think just at a smaller scale, so they can get away with more patchiness in the forest. And again, that's very speculative, but that's what it seems to be down is they, were, they live in these bigger rivers that the changes across the entire landscape is still affecting them. So given that B cell is a waterborne uh, pathogen fungus, what could that do if that got out into the major river systems? Yeah, it, it's something we definitely don't want. Hopefully we'll never have to see what happens, but it's still up in the air exactly how it's going to affect them. Is it going to be like BD where... As long as the populations that are healthy are being maintained, they can maintain infection and be just fine. Or is it going to be kind of pushing them over that, giving them the final straw where it's a novel pathogen on top of all of these other issues where the, the populations kind of reach a tipping point. And so that's where we're most worried. And again, you're right, it's waterborne and these chytrid fungi are in the water and a lot of more aquatic species are much more likely to encounter this pathogen than the terrestrial species. BD is already highly prevalent, and while only a portion of hellbenders swabbed were likely to have it, that doesn't mean a higher percentage doesn't. Detection isn't the same thing as the actual prevalence. It's like with COVID-19. You could test a dozen people in one day, but still have no hard conclusion whether or not the disease was actually present in your community. From my study and the several different studies that have tested hellbenders for BD, it just does, there does not seem to be a regional pattern. Um, there are certain rivers where we didn't find BD, but honestly, it's in rivers where we didn't have a very large sampling effort, or really we didn't sample a lot of individuals. And you can 
miss it at that point, you know, if you're not coming back regularly. BD has seasonal fluctuations in other amphibian species that we know about based on temperature, based on the host health. And so, you know, you're going to have to do some comprehensive sampling sometimes to really say that there is no BD in a system, depending on when you sample and how many individuals you get. And hellbenders are definitely tough to get. And what's also frustrating is in these populations that are declining, you know, you can work all day and maybe get, maybe if you're lucky, get one individual and that's negative. What does that tell you? Well, it could tell you that there's no BD or it could tell you that maybe all the ones that died did have BD. We just didn't sample them because we, you know, they'd already died. With the coronavirus right now, actually, I feel like the United States and the world is starting to understand, you know, what detection means, you know, they're, you know, so that's something that people actually understand now. I feel like this would be another thing where detection's a big thing. And if the animals have died before you test it, you know, then you just didn't detect it, but it still could be there. So right now it's a lot of muddled data, but all we know is that it seems to be everywhere. And and that's all we know. (laughs) So in comparison to other salamanders, hellbenders are, it sounds like exceedingly hard to to even catch in the wild. How do you do that? (laughs) Just out of curiosity. (laughs) Yeah, you know, it, it's it's fun and it's hard work and there are long days. But I will tell you, you know, people give us some stares. You know, you go to some of these rivers where you put on full scuba gear. The rivers can be really cold. So sometimes you have a hood and you got a mask. So you look like aliens. And when you say you're working the stream, you get these things called log PVs, which pretty much just provide a fulcrum where you can put one part of it on the rock and then push up at the end of the stick. And then someone actually swims under the rock trust that you have a good hold on it because these are large boulders and looks and searches under the rock for the hellbender you know snorkeling all day upstream it's really hard and some of these fast flowing waters you know it actually gets dangerous you know the ro- if the rock slips off what we call the log pv it, it drops and people's fingers get smashed luckily we we have a good team and you know we've been safe and nothing's happened but it, it can be scary and you know people out there kind of give you a strange look you know what are you doing out here <laughs> In, in Arkansas, they actually, the water's too deep for normal snorkeling. So they'll put on 50 pound weights, strap those on, get what we call a snoo, I call it a snuba, where it's just a, a dive regulator attached to an air compressor on the boat. And you just jump down maybe 10, 15 feet at the bottom of the river and you clunk to the bottom and you just crawl along looking for hellbenders. <laughs> It should be noted that there are two distinct hellbender subspecies that Dr. Hartman studied. And while they are similar, there are some key distinctions that set them apart. You know, I think the people who's, who have worked with both can tell differences. The spotting pattern is a little different when you look at them enough, where you might say that the Ozark hellbenders have a little bit darker, more chocolate chip type spots, <laughs> uh, where the eastern hellbenders maybe a little bit, the spots are a little bit more dispersed. The Ozarks maybe, in my opinion, at least the ones in Arkansas I looked with, maybe have just a little bit of a darker, more orange appearance to them. But, you know, the Easterns also have, they have such a variety of tinges of brown and spotting that it's really hard to say. And really what it comes down to is their genetics are very different. And that's just, you know, looking at their genes and how diverged those two groups are. So is it possible then that their reactions to chytrid fungi could be different among those two different populations? Yes, I definitely agree. And one of the hypotheses about why the Ozark hellbenders have these lesions is that for whatever reason, they declined quicker. Now, it may be habitat, that some of the habitat is pretty bad in those guys, and that they actually became genetically bottlenecked And when you're genetically bottlenecked, it also bottlenecks the diversity of immune genes you have to fight off potential pathogens. And that may affect your immunity and how well you can fend things off. So it definitely could affect how they deal with these two different chytrid fungi. Dr. Hardman noticed that the main difference between these two subspecies was in their microbiome, which may suggest that the Ozark hellbender could be less effective at fighting off disease. Yeah, with the actual pathogen prevalence, they're all subtle changes. I didn't actually see too much of a difference there. The differences I did see was I tested, or I I looked at 
the skin peptides produced by both subspecies, as well as I looked a little bit at the microbiome. Still all kind of unpublished. I'm still working through it. But I can say that there are differences between the two. And at least in the Ozark hellbenders, it seems to be a consistent difference from the Eastern hellbenders in changes in the skin peptide and the microbiome that may show that they are they're not as good at fighting off potential infections. The microbiome is, is super preliminary. I, I, all I know is that it's different, but I can't say how that functions. The peptides though are interesting because I did find that even though my sample size was very small from Arkansas, that the Arkansas animals, those peptides were not, that when I actually tested the peptides against how they might kill a pathogen in the lab, so in a Petri dish or in a well, the peptides I had from Arkansas were consistently less effective at killing chytrid fungi. This means they could potentially be even more at risk of dying in greater numbers from a B-cell pandemic. Yes, potentially. And, and again, I don't know if it was just because the Ozark hellbenders are already have these lesions, and when you're sick, you have, you know, it's just when you're um, really stressed out or anything, you have immunosuppression, or when you have a viral infection, then it sets you up for a bacterial infection, you know? So it may be because they have these lesions and if we had an, a healthy Ozark animal, then that would go away. That I still don't know, but yeah, the, the ones with lesions in the wild right now, I think are definitely more at risk and we should worry about them. And just to clarify, you noticed less lesions on the Eastern hellbenders. Am, am, I, am I getting that right? That is correct. And if I did see lesions in hellbenders, there was a variety of them and a much, much less severe. And I was really focusing on the toes is where we're seeing a lot of stuff. And so I, th I think I've seen a picture of it. It almost looks like a, their poor little hand is just swollen. Like there's a little, like a little ball on the palm of it. Is that what it looks like? Yeah. And it, it, you know, it depends kind of on, on which subspecies, but in the Ozark specifically, all their toes will get swollen. And then you'll start seeing ulcerations, which pretty much is that that skin layer is kind of peeling off and revealing the lower layers. And, you know, then you're getting actually necrosis or tissue death where the toes are actually sloughing off. And it's really, it looks painful and, and it's, it's sad to see. Clearly, we don't want a B-cell pandemic, but there's more than keeping it at bay that we can all do to protect the species. Yeah, I, I think what people are doing now is, you know, you know, outreach, letting people know that we have these wonderful creatures, these like an American icon here, right? And, you know, a lot of things we can do is, you know, prevent rock flipping, you know, don't move the rocks is a, is a big campaign we're trying right now because people like to rock stack and that definitely affects their homes. Um, you know, don't poach them, don't kill them. But the big one that we're really trying to push and unfortunately takes the most effort and coordination and money is fixing that forest buffer we're talking about, you know, getting the banks of the streams back in order so they don't erode so much into the system all the time, making sure that we actually have a good forested buffer around the river that every time it rains, it just doesn't wash everything into the river in one fell swoop to really, really cause changes in that river bottom and expose these animals to whatever was on that surface. Really, really is what we need is is fixing the banks and the, and the forest buffer. But unfortunately, that takes a lot of work, right? You can imagine how many miles of stream and river we need to be along to actually uh, do that and, and work with so many different partners to do that. Before leaving the conversation, I asked Dr. Hardman for some parting thoughts, and she delivered a salient point beyond amphibian health that has implications for our own human health as well. There's, there's this buzzword out there, one health. And I, I think that still needs to be more of a buzzword is really, you know, people ask me, why is this important? You know, people ask that all the time. Why are hellbenders important? And I have a few answers to that. And one is, first of all, this is something that is, it's part of who we are. It's, you know, it's our backyard. It's something we should take ownership of. And if something's going on with these animals, we should care just inherently. But even if you don't care about the hellbender, think about the water that you depend on, that we all depend on, and these animals are living in it. And they're not, you know, some kind of small mammal that lives a couple years and dies. These guys live over 20 years. And so they're a really good indicator of what can happen if you're exposed over time to a lot of things. You know, these guys, they're showing signs of problems of 
potentially something that they've been exposed to for decades. And so that should raise alarms for us that, okay, you know, these guys are telling us something that maybe we need to get our act together and fix these streams before we start seeing more problems. If we focus on making things healthier for them, we're going to benefit because we're making the streams healthier for us. Not necessarily just to prevent us from being sick, for us enjoying it. Like you said, you know, you're out for a walk. It's not really fun to see degraded banks and muddy rivers. You know, everyone loves going to the mountains to get away from it all because that's something to cherish. So I think really just kind of working together and understanding that the goal is, is hellbenders and us together. That point becomes even more clear in my conversation with Dr. Anna Longo, who described a similarly challenging situation with the much smaller but ample eastern newt, which, as you will find out, could become a super spreader. So I'm Anna Longo. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Biology at University of Florida. And my lab is interested in looking at the disease ecology of amphibian diseases, especially BD and B cell in salamanders and also in frogs. So I've been working for a long time. I started when I was actually an undergrad at University of Puerto Rico. We had like three species of frogs uh, that were endemic to the island that were became extinct. And we believe it was because of BD. When I learned about that, I was like, I want to do research. I want to know more about this. And it's been like almost like 15 years now that I've been working on these diseases. We noticed that it, it was happening in Puerto Rico. So when I was an undergrad, I started working with BD um, and the chytrid fungi. But specifically with salamanders, this was for my postdoc under the supervision of Dr. Lips at the University of Maryland. And over there, we were interested in looking at these co-infections especially with the eastern newts. So we wanted to study these species because, as you may know, it's one of the most widespread species in the United States. So we know that it occurs from Canada almost to, to, to Texas. If you are thinking about how many states are covered by these species, it's almost like, I don't know, like 35 states. So pretty much more than half of the United States has the presence of these newts. And from previous studies that were done by the Europeans, they identify that species that as a susceptible species that B cell was lethal to it. So in my case, I knowing that information, I wanted to know like, well, I know that they are infected with BD. So what, what's going to happen if we just add on top of that another pathogen? Much like in the case of the hellbender, the eastern newts are already afflicted with BD in many cases. But unlike the hellbender, we know that eastern newts fare even worse when infected with B cell. How many of them are estimated to be affected with BD? That's a very good question. I don't know the, the, the number, but what we know is that salamanders as a whole, like all the salamanders, have been neglected and not have been studying that much in terms of BD. Most species of plethodontid, so those are the longest salamanders, they tend to be resistant to BD, so people kind of like don't study them. But now that we have this new threat of B cell, now that's going to become more important. Just to clarify, the hellbender is a plethodontid, and the eastern newt is a different family, the salamandrids. Dr. Longo explains in greater detail what this means. So Blethodontid is, is a family of salamanders and is one of the most abundant families in the world of salamanders. So we have approximately like 480 species of Blethodontid salamanders and most of them, the biggest diversity, it occurs in the United States, actually in eastern United States. So as a whole, like we are one of the hotspots for the diversity of Blethodontids. Eastern newts are not Blethodontids, they are in another family, so they are salamanders salamandridae and they are aquatic species right so they like everything that I, I i was reading in the literature seems to suggest that they were living with enzootic infections of bd so they seem to persist they're surviving and not that much mortality going on at least that we can detect so with that information, I was like, well, so they have BD, so now what, what's going to happen with B cell, right? And the idea here is that, that we have this uh, species that is very widespread, right? And, and we want to know, like, if we add on top a, a new pathogen, how are they going to respond? Well, the first thing it could be, right, it could be that they are 
they could be resistant to it or like the same defenses that they're using against BD to kind of like tolerate the infection, they can use it towards B cell as well. And we did some experiments to try to test that. And we found out that actually like co-infections, like having both BD and B cell was worse for the for these salamanders than having just BD or just B cell by itself. So kind of like a compounding effect over stressing their system and making them stressed out and sick. Exactly, exactly. So what we think is what's happening is that they are focusing all their immune defenses towards BD because they kind of like know the pathogen, right? Their immune system knows the pathogen. And then B cell is kind of like taking the advantage and growing more because it's kind of like left untouched by the immune system. But having both things at the same time, then it's like you can observe a stronger mortality of, of these individuals in a faster time. You may recall just previously that Dr. Harbin mentioned the evidence of compounding stress factors on hellbenders seemed to indicate a higher chance of developing disease symptoms. The same holds true for eastern newts. Can you tell me why are the eastern newts so prevalent and widespread in the United States? They have different things, right? The ecology is very interesting. They have distinct life stages, right? So they, they're they aquatic and also have some a terrestrial phase, which we call the eft, and then they transform into aquatic adults, right? So they occupy many different areas of the habitats, right? From anything from like ponds or lakes and or other like bodies of water, right? And then they can exploit also the the terrestrial areas as well. The, some interesting things about about the newts is that they are a very long-lived species. So the estimates are like around 15 years. So that's that's a long time for for a small um, salamander, right? It takes them a long time also to metamorphose. So it takes them anything from two to seven years to get into the aquatic form into adults. So we see that that they also can lay a lot of eggs. So anything from 200 to maybe like 400 eggs every time they, they breed. And so you see that they are very successful at surviving and just like a, a spreading and maintaining those populations in a, in a very good, in good abundances, right? If you go to like, and this was in the past, I don't know if people have redone these experiments, but in one pond, in a single pond, you can see more than like almost like 3,000 individuals of new in there. So you see that these animals are like super highly abundant in a very small place. And that's what makes them interesting in terms of the disease aspects, right? Because if you have a species that is that abundant and also that susceptible as well, it can definitely be a carrier of the disease for other species, or it can also cause a lot of outbreaks around like a big area. Similar to hellbenders, eastern newts live incredibly long. But unlike them, they are partially terrestrial, at least during their early lives, which uniquely gives them great opportunity to spread B. cell, coupled with the fact that they are so abundant and you have a perfect storm. Can you tell me, just so our listeners have a picture of it, how big, roughly, is it? They are very small. I would say like maybe like like three inches. They're very small. The Fs are the ones that are more like, um, you can see them everywhere, right? So if you see like an, an orange um, salamander, that's probably an F of the Eastern Newt. But then they convert into another color, which is like more like yellow and brownish on top with dots. A three-inch salamander that lives 15 years, partially on land and partially in the water, and reproduces abundantly. It makes you wonder, what might happen if B. sal was introduced? That's a very good question. So we think like if our experiments, right, and every susceptibility trial that we've done is correct, right, and it, if it's representative of what could happen in nature, we know that we are going to lost a lot of these animals like very fast. And the, the timing, it's going to be like just weeks, right? So in the lab that we start seeing, uh, uh, we start observing mortality like in, in 15 to 22 days. So that is fast. And we're definitely going to be able to observe that and the consequences across like many areas of of the ecosystem are going to become evident and what are some of those consequences 
So anything that that depends on on these animals to survive, right? Uh, not that much probably in the afts because the afts they they have like this toxin, right? That they, it becomes it makes them unpalatable to predators, right? So they might not be the ones that, that suffer that much, but maybe the adults, right, that are eaten by other animals and and play some roles in the ecosystem are going to be important for for the ecosystem. The afts secrete a neurotoxin that paralyzes predators and later dr longo describes how this might actually protect salamanders from b sal but of the 35 states with eastern newts the question still remains of where it would strike first it would depend right so if it's related to pet trade it depends like if we're exactly right but if we're thinking about more about the movement of people um maybe something near an airport right or we we don't we just don't know honestly would it be a fair assessment to say that the areas that are the most densely populated or have the highest population of salamanders, biodiversity of salamanders, would be hit the hardest first? Yeah, you can say that. I'm comfortable saying that. I think so. We've had other examples, right, with like the bat of fungus as well. Like with we see that it only takes like one person, right, to go to I don't know the Smoky Mountains or like to anywhere in eastern United States that has、um, these species to be able to spread. It. And the latest results that we've seen from other labs suggest that it only takes like one second contact of of an infected animal to another one to to produce like mortality. You know, it doesn't take that much. A second or two to transmit the fungus is frightening and makes one wonder what we can do as individuals to slow a potential spread. That's that's a very good question, and I think you know, considering that now. People are more aware because of the pandemic that we're currently suffering with coronavirus of the importance of like cleaning and disinfecting our like gear, for example, our shoes, anything that we use that it becomes like wet that could potentially carry those、uh, in the infective stage of this fungus. It's just like taking another an extra step, right, and and try to to clean and and. Obviously, like not releasing any animals that we have in in our house as the pets to native areas. You may recall that the firebelly salamander population in the Netherlands was nearly completely wiped out by B-sal. I asked Dr. Longo if we could see the same thing in North America with the eastern newt. Yeah, definitely. I'm more hopeful because the experiments that we've done, it seems. To suggest that not every single individual dies of the infection, and that's supported by other other labs that have also done the same. So there's going to be some survivors for sure, and those are the ones that we're we're hoping that can maintain the populations afloat, right? But definitely, it's still. The because of the the abundance of these salamanders, probably they're more abundant than the fire salamanders in Europe. So that can create、uh, more opportunities for other species that are using the same habitats to become infected, right? So maybe you have like plethodontids that don't necessarily not all of them. Have to go to a pond to the water, right? Some of them are direct developers, but guess what? Maybe the Fs can be the ones carrying the infection in the terrestrial areas that those salamanders are. So we have the opportunities because of the life history of this species to serve as a carrier for other more susceptible species or other species that have a smaller range, a limited range that only occur in like one specific area and don't occur in other places. And of course, even if the eastern newt survives in greater numbers, the fallout from spreading the disease to other salamanders may be even worse. Yeah, exactly. And and the other difference is we have like in case of the the fire salamander, those are mostly terrestrial species. So it's a it go they go to the ponds to reproduce, but in in the other at other times they are like in 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 the forest and other areas. But we have this species with the eastern newt that it's like coming in and out of the ponds, right? They're they're moving around. They have different faces, so we we know that there's a higher potential for them to become these carrier 
or four other, or as we call it, it's a super spreader. Remember, they can live on land for up to seven years before heading into the water for another seven to eight years. They can metamorphose into like it takes them to metamorphose from from the aft right. So they that's the terrestrial phase, two to seven years. And then if they um, can are long lived with like fifteen years, it, it means that they're like eight years or or potentially more inside that pond. So um, that's a long time, right? And and they are using that area for a long time. I asked Dr. Longo to summarize a few points to stress about the situation we face with eastern newts in the context of B-cell, and she offered some sobering insight. But she also wanted to make clear that there was more to understand about the various species of salamanders that could potentially be resistant to it. So I think co-infections are, are something very important that we have to be aware of, especially in the states where we have BD that is very widespread like across the states. And, and not only the states, you know, we we're talking about all the Americas have suffered a lot with BD already. And just adding on top of that, B-cell, we don't, actually don't know what's going to happen because that's a completely different scenario of what we're observing in Europe. So in Europe, there's there's BD, but it hasn't been that much of a force in, in danger, not endangering, but threatening um, the populations of, of salamanders. And also the other th- part that I want to mention too is that we're always like with B cell as when it got discovered, right? It, it made a huge deal that it was like a salamander fungus, but actually it can infect also frogs too. So um, the potentials for to threaten a lot of different amphibians is also very high. So we, we should just be aware that we have to understand the interactions between these two pathogens that are, have endangered and threatened so many species globally. And also I want to mention, right, it's not all dire too, right? It's not all gloom and doom. Um, we have species in the states that are actually resistant to BD as well. So we have the potential to, it could go both ways, right? It could be like for some species, it's going to be B cell, the, like the emergence of B cell in the States, it's going to be like really bad and it's going to impact many populations. But maybe for other species that are already resistant to, to BD, maybe they can be resistant to B cell as well. We have to make sure to say that there's th- those two possibilities, right? The way that we're seeing it right now, just based on on not of thalmus on the on the eastern newts, it seems that it's going to be a widespread infection if it reaches the appropriate host for it. Right in this case, like this type of super spreader that I, like the eastern newt. You mentioned that some species are resistant to it, and I, I need to kind of address that. So, what species have you? found that are resistant to it that you are doing work on? Well, it hasn't been published, but if you want to read more about other resistant species of, of plethodontids, for example, in the Martell paper, you can find at least, I think they found two of them that are resistant to B-cell. In our case, we've worked with species from Florida, and we've found that at least uh, maybe like one species is potentially like completely resistant to it. There are others that can get infected and and can survive the infection. And we also have instances of a plethodonte that it's also very highly susceptible, almost like the same case as, as the newts too. I wish I could tell you like all plethodontids are more resistant, but that's that's not the case, right? There's going to be always like one species on another that has a, a, a particular adaptation that brings them more closer to water, for example, and that increases their exposure. It varies a lot, and we still don't know exactly like how, how these things work. Rewinding for just a moment, Dr. Longo previously mentioned the eastern newt secreting a neurotoxin in its early terrestrial stage. Well, it turns out it's the same one as a salamander out in the West, and the levels of the neurotoxin were negatively correlated to the prevalence of BD in the species, which Longo says could be a positive sign for eastern newts. Other species of salamanders, like um, the newts in the western part of the United States, right, right, Tarika, I don't know if someone has, has talked about this with you before. 
So those are the other species that we are kind of like worried too, because they they are very similar in terms of their susceptibility as well. We we think right. These animals have like this adaptation that their skin con- contains tetrodotoxin, right? So this is a very potent neurotoxin that makes them unpalatable and and kind of like what happens is that it 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 blocks the sodium channels of of the different cells and it kind of like paralyzes, right? And that's how they killed their potential predators. And there's some studies that have been shown in, in the in the West, right? So we're talking about that the Tarika, it's not specifically about the newts, that these animals and the concentration of the tetrodoxin it's negatively correlated to BD and all their parasites as well. That's something that it's very helpful and and hopefully like it happens also in the eastern newt and that's uh, a way or a mechanism that they might be able to survive the infection. At least some individuals. Dr. Longo elaborated that the eastern newts that aren't dying of B cell may actually be getting a defense boost from this neurotoxin. So what I'm what I'm trying to say is that because we're seeing that there's some variation in their susceptibility to B cell because not all of them um, are dying, right? In our in our experiments. So this is based on, entirely on experiments. There's the possibility that that if this is a mechanism, right? If this toxin is a mechanism, maybe those are the ones, the ones that are surviving are the ones that have maybe more toxin in their skin. But we we don't know. Quite rightly, these conversations raise some questions that, unfortunately, we don't have the answers to and hopefully won't have to find out. I'd like to personally thank Dr. Hardman and Dr. Longo for sharing their valuable expertise with myself and Manga Bay on these two special and fascinating salamanders. This is the final episode in the B-South series of Manga Bay Explores, and it has been my privilege reporting on this issue. I encourage you to listen to episodes 1 through 5 of this inaugural series of Manga Bay Explorers to learn more about the B-Cell pandemic and what is being done to stop it. I'd like to extend a hearty thanks to our podcast producer, Eric Hoffner, and also to Rhett Butler. Watch for a new edition of Manga Bay Explorers every two weeks in between episodes of our flagship podcast, the Manga Bay Newscast. Special projects like this are made possible by our Patreon supporters. Manga Bay is a nonprofit news provider, so we rely on the generosity of our listeners, readers, and friends. To add your support, head to patreon.com forward slash Manga Bay to learn more. Keep up with all of Manga Bay's news from Nature's Frontline at mangabay.com or get updates via Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, where our handle is at Manga Bay. Thank you once again, and we will be back soon with another episode of Manga Bay Explorers. <laughs>